Today marks the first time the United States as a nation will recognize the second Monday of October as Indigenous Peoples Day. This follows a growing movement to debunk the myth of Christopher Columbus as beneficent discoverer and replace it with recognition that the arrival of Christopher Columbus in the Bahamas unleashed a brutal genocide that massacred tens of millions of Native peoples across the hemisphere. President Biden Friday issued the first ever presidential proclamation of Indigenous Peoples Day to honor, quote, our diverse history and the indigenous peoples who contribute to shaping this nation. Indigenous Peoples Day is now a paid state holiday in Alaska, Iowa, Maine, Minnesota, New Mexico, Nevada, North Carolina, Oregon, which celebrates both Columbus Day and Native American Day and South Dakota, Vermont and Wisconsin. More than 100 U.S. cities have also replaced Columbus Day with Indigenous Peoples Day. Even Columbus, Ohio, the largest city named after the Italian invader, stopped celebrating Columbus Day in 2018. Last year, it declared October 12th Indigenous Peoples Day, with the Columbus City Council President Shannon Hardin saying, quote, it's impossible to think about a more just future without recognizing these original sins of our past, she said. On Friday, Associated Press reporter Amr Madani questioned White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki about Indigenous Peoples Day. The president became um, the first U.S. president to recognize Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, why should the U.S. Um, continue to celebrate Columbus Day? Um, and has there been any talk or discussion of as many cities and I think a few states have shifted from Columbus Day um, to an Indigenous Peoples Day? Well, today is both Columbus Day, as of now, and this is why you're asking the question, as well as Indigenous uh, Peoples Day. I'm not aware of any discussion of ending that, uh, either of ending the, the prior federal holiday at this point. Uh, but I know that uh, recognizing today as Indigenous Peoples Day is something that the president felt uh, strongly about personally. He's happy to be the first president to celebrate um, and to make it um, uh, the, 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 the history of moving forward. For more, we're joined by two guests. In New Mexico, Jennifer Marley, a member of the Red Nation, a grassroots indigenous liberation organization that helped lead a campaign in 2015 to officially recognize Indigenous Peoples Day in Albuquerque, New Mexico. She's a citizen of San Ildefonso Pueblo and a Ph.D. student in the American Studies Department at the University of New Mexico. Also with us from San Francisco, one of the first cities to recognize Indigenous Peoples Day, is Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz, historian and author of many books, including An Indigenous People's History of the United States and, most recently, Not a Nation of Immigrants, Settler Colonialism, White Supremacy and a History of Erasure and Elimination. It includes a chapter on Columbus and so-called Columbus Day. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Um, Roxanne Dumba Ortiz, let's begin with you. San Francisco, very early on, um, I believe decades ago, recognized Indigenous Peoples Day. Can you talk about the first presidential proclamation, Biden on Friday, recognizing it, that the significance of this? Well, thank you, Amy, and hello, uh, Jennifer. Um, yeah, you know, actually, it was Berkeley that first uh, uh, recognized Indigenous Peoples Day in 1992 uh, during the Ken Centennial. Uh, San Francisco came, uh, I think, about five or six years later. Uh, but Berkeley, you know, things start in Berkeley. Uh, people think they're crazy there, and then suddenly it's uh, everywhere. Uh, so that was important. It was an effort of uh, uh, Ohlone people, uh, Native people from all over Northern California, and wonderful allies in Berkeley. Uh, so that was the beginning. Uh, we haven't gotten rid of Fleet Week, which just uh, was here for a week, warships in our bay, and the Blue Angels strafing us for five days. Uh, to celebrate Columbus and the Italian parade in North Beach. So uh, it's still, you know, Columbus is still being celebrated. But um, I think it's important to know that 
ever since the holiday has been, uh, since Franklin Roosevelt made it a, a federal holiday, uh, Native people have, have spoken out against this, and it can be documented back uh, into the 1940s. But especially in 1977, when uh, indigenous peoples of the Western Hemisphere went to the United Nations, uh, to the Palais de Nation in Geneva, where the uh, human rights bodies are located, and um, uh, had were welcomed there, a uh, hundred representatives, and one of the main um, uh, demands they made in the you know which finally uh, became the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples in 2007, was that October 12th be considered um, and named the International Day of Solidarity and Mourning with the Indigenous Peoples of the Americas. And I think that was when internationally and nationally that the, the real movement was uh, set off. And of course, we had looming ahead of us the Ken Centenary of uh, 1992, which uh, Spain and, and the United States uh, in particular teamed up to um, make a, uh, a huge, uh, a huge uh, uh, celebration worldwide. Uh, they failed miserably, uh, thanks to uh, Native people mobilizing, uh, not just in the Western Hemisphere, but really all over the world. So I think the developments at the UN um, with the indigenous, uh, uh, indigenous peoples going onto the world stage has really made this possible. I, I never thought I would see it. Uh, <laughs> You know, in the 1960s or 70s, it didn't seem like uh, there would ever be any questioning of um, uh, of the role of Columbus. But it will be a long struggle still. Uh, it's just not uh, appropriate to celebrate Columbus and indigenous peoples on the same day. It's a contradiction. Um, one is a genocidal uh, enslavement uh, is what uh, Columbus represents, and uh, uh, and the situation of Native people today, still under colonialism, uh, with uh, shrunken land bases um, and not true sovereignty, uh, is uh, is the fruit of that beginning, and they're completely contradictory. So. It will, you know, would require an act of Congress, and uh, that would be difficult. Uh, the Italian community and the Catholic Church would um, uh, definitely uh, oppose this. So we have really a, a, a long ways to go to make it real. But as Jennifer said, it's the Indigenous Peoples Day, and it cannot uh, be co-opted into uh, tolerating Columbus being alongside it. You write in Teen Vogue, Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz, as of 2020, there were some 150 statues of Columbus across the U.S., most but not all of them the work of the Catholic lay organization the Knights of Columbus and Italian communities. During the Black Lives Matter mass mobilization in 2020, at least 33 of the statues were either pulled down by protesters or removed by authorities for safekeeping storage. Can you talk about the forces behind this recent act? Activism. Well, I think the most um, uh, significant um, part of that, and uh, Jennifer knows it, you know, on the ground, is the, the Black Lives Matter-led um, uh, movement um, teamed up. I, I think it was when it was Albuquerque and, and Minnesota uh, especially where the fusion of um, and solidarity, like I've never seen, um, came together to take down uh, those Columbus statues in, in uh, Albuquerque and 
and uh, Minneapolis, and uh, also in Albuquerque, the Spanish, uh, the uh, you know the Spanish uh, um, conquistadors who are so worshipped by the Hispanos there, and uh, that was really significant. I, I think one thing that surprised me was when they were taking them down in the state capitol, I actually was not aware that they had a Queen Isabella um, statue there, too. So that was taken down as well. Uh, you know, the Spanish conqueror of, uh, of uh, um, Mexico and where New Mexico and, of course, California are. So we have a double whammy here in the Southwest in California of the Spanish uh, conquest and Columbus really being closer to the grain uh, than most U.S. Anglo um, uh, people really understand. So I think that's why you find such profound actions uh, in New Mexico and um, Teo land. Uh, um, that Jennifer is in, this is going to be the, this is a real leadership, you know, really of the national and, uh, Native movement. And we're going to go to New Mexico in one minute, but I wanted to ask you about your latest book, Not a Nation of Immigrants, Settler Colonialism, White Supremacy, and a History of Erasure and Elimination. Before that, an Indigenous People's History of the United States. Um, not an immigrant nation. Uh, you're sort of <clears throat> debunking uh, that term that President Kennedy coined, right? An immigrant nation. Yes, as uh, uh, John F. Kennedy, when he was senator, uh, wrote a little book, published it, which has been a bestseller ever since. And it really seeped into the whole uh, liberal culture, I would say. I don't think right-wingers, you know, carry that book around. Um, but it was called The Nation of Immigrants. And, of course, he was uh, Catholic and uh, a child of uh, Irish immigrants. And this had never happened before, a president that was not Anglo-Saxon or Scots-Irish and descended from the original settlers. Uh, so he had a, a quite a hill to climb uh, to make himself palatable. So I think that um, the, the way was already paved, I think, by uh, the previous uh, half century or more <clears throat> with the work of the Knights of Columbus. Uh, the Knights were formed in 1882 and uh, uh, by Irish uh, clerics. Uh, most of the Irish famine immigrants who had, had come in the 1840s and really refugees um, had, it, it took, you know, 20 or 30 years to sort of assimilate into, uh, they had an advantage of speaking English, unlike the Italians uh, who came in the 1890s and turn of the century in great numbers. Um, so they absorbed, uh, they really presented, the Catholic Church presented to the Italian this idea of the lineage of Columbus. And it was already there in the political or, you know, mythical culture in the United States um, of, they, they actually discussed, I didn't know this till I did the research, they actually discussed the founders um, uh, uh, naming the United States uh, Columbia, uh, which is Latin for the land of Columbus. And uh, that, that really was uh, surprising to me because I thought it was really more an invention of the late 19th century with the Knights of Columbus. But there is this mythology of uh, Columbus as uh, as the founder of the United States, the actual founder of the United States. So I think that attachment, that makes me better understand that attachment to Columbus statues everywhere that is kind of in the, it's not spoken about, but it's just kind of in the culture. And then of course it was greatly uh, amplified uh, by Italians taking it up as um, um, it's a way of becoming Americanized. 
And of course, there was no Italy when Columbus uh, is from Genoa, a city-state. Uh, he died in Spain. Um, so, the, you know, it's a very weak link uh, to Italianness. And of course, Italians have such illustrious people they can celebrate, uh, that everyone celebrates, and Michelangelo, and Vivaldi, and of course, for us on the left, Sacco and Vanzetti, you know, um, it's, uh, it, it really is, I think we have to really um, talk about this. Uh, and I, I think it's important, you know, these symbols are very important for how people think, um, the kind of Americanism and, um, you know, a, a, a patriotism that is based on such falsehood um, uh, and the reality of, of slavery, uh, enslavement of Africans, which is a part of that package of Columbus. Um, the um, Holy See, uh, the papal bulls, had already given Africa to the Portuguese when Columbus came to the Americas. And then they gave, um, through a papal bull, 1493, gave all the Americas to the Spanish. Uh, they could enslave. It, it was the permission to enslave legally under the Holy Roman Empire. So it's, um, yeah, it's a very, very, very uh, uh, deep history I tried to do uh, in you know, not making it too, um, you know, archival and, and hard to read, but just laying it out. And it, I think the book ha has a dynamism simply because I was learning so much as I, as I wrote it. Roxanne uh, dunbar Ortiz, I want to thank you for being with us, historian and author of many books, including An Indigenous People's History of the United States and, most recently, her book Not a Nation of Immigrants, Settler Colonialism, White Supremacy and a History of Erasure and Elimination. Next up, we go to New Mexico, a site of major indigenous activism. We'll speak with a member of Red Nation, which helped lead the campaign for Albuquerque to recognize Indigenous Peoples Day. Stay with us.